any of you ever been to Hot Springs, Arkansas? So in, in Arkansas, in this spot, thousands and thousands of years ago, like 4,000, 7,000 years ago, the rainwater washed down and dribbled down into the center of the earth. So it went down so far that it was warmed by the, the heat at the center of our planet. And then that water bubbles back up in these two, between these two mountains and creates this hot spring. So in Hot Springs, Arkansas, the National Park is one of the smallest ones we have and is mostly indoors. Whereas in most of the national parks we'll visit this summer, it's outside that you go to visit. At the Hot Springs location, there are some hiking trails, but the reason you're going there is to visit the hot springs, the water, to see and be healed by the water that flows out of those springs. So in hot springs, they, um, it's been a site that has been used for healing for generations upon generations. It started with Native Americans who first discovered it, and it, they created it as a spot of peace where different tribal groups would meet together and they would agree not to fight over this particular area, and they would bathe in the water. It's a spot where during Prohibition, the bootleggers used to gather, like Al Capone and many of those people, would go to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they would put aside their warring differences with each other to soak in the healing waters. In Hot Springs, after World War I, they created um, what we would call now physical therapy, but they created hospitals and settings where people could come and seek healing. So many of the soldiers from the wars there's a hospital that is across from where the park is that was a veterans hospital that the soldiers could come to and they used the springs to um, facilitate their healing. Because if any of you have arthritis know, getting into hot water gives you a sigh of relief for a little bit, right? It makes the pain go away. And so when you're rehabilitating from um, injuries that you got in war, that water can help to heal or um, get rid of the inflammation so that it's easier for them to work on you and help you to recover. So why choose this national park and then the reading I gave you of Moses, right? The only connection I have is the water coming out of rocks, right? In our story today from Moses, what we have in Moses' journey is the continuing worry and complaining and grumbling of the people. But I want you to think about this, okay? They are on this journey into a wilderness that is not green lush forest with lots of fruit and vegetables and berries that you can pick that has streams running through it. They're on a journey through the desert. And so their complaint today, so remember the complaints we've had already. What do you mean we can escape through a giant body of water from soldiers? Then our next complaint was, why did you bring us here where there's no food? And so God supplies manna and quail. So today, the question that the people raise, why did you bring us out of Egypt if there's no water? Because I want you to think about this. What does it mean to not have water? I mean, some of us are struggling with it this summer, being told that we can't water any of our outdoor plants. And so there are varying degrees of cheating going on around Hinkley, right? Um, <laughs> But we've made accommodations and most of us have cut back on how much we water. But that 
that's a different question when you're in a desert environment. How long can you survive without water? And how long can you survive without water and be walking, right? Like there's a difference between being able to survive without water if you are sitting under a shady outcropped rock, right? And moving, chasing your children and your animals and carrying a tent and bags. How much water do you lose in your body when you are moving? So they have a legitimate argument here of saying, why did you bring us out to this spot, to this place, when there is no water? Does God really care about us? I mean, because that's how their question ends, right? Does God care about us that God would do that, bring us to this spot without water? So you know Moses' response to people, right? If they grumble at him, he then grumbles at God, right? So he takes their complaint, and now their complaint, according to the text, was, why have you brought us out of Egypt where there's no water? He says to God, they're going to kill me. I feel like they're going to kill me if you don't do something about this water situation. He takes their complaint to God and says, you need to do something. You've made my life impossible with these people. And so God says to them, to Moses, here's what I want from you. I want you to bring the elders with you. And I want you to come up onto this spot with your staff. And I will, I will show my presence and water will come from the rocks. So Moses goes back down, gathers the elders, brings them up. God's presence walks by. Moses does the staff and water pours out from the rock. There's a lot going on in that passage. Some of which you don't recognize because we're reading it in English. So it gives the name of the place that they're not going to call this. And did you know those names? Say they say Meribah. And those names mean, the two places that they name, mean testing and quarreling. So. It's a, it's a joke, right, in the Hebrew, that testing and quarreling are the place where God's people tested and quarreled. But one of the interesting things about this text is it, it challenges sort of Moses' position and challenges God, right? Like, up until this point, the people had to believe Moses. Right? There was no proof except for Moses and his step. They didn't have that experience of God as a reality for themselves. They were doing it mediated through Moses. And yes, they saw all the plagues in that. But there's something different when you experience that sense of God's presence surrounding you and holding you, right? And so... The people, in this instance, that sense of God's presence is expanded. That God shows God's self to the elders and to Moses. Now the other thing you wouldn't know from this text is where it's happening at. That this mountain, this mountain where the rock gives us water, is the same mountain where the burning bush happened. This is the holy mountain. The mountain where God first called Moses and invited him to save the people. This mountain, where the people are demanding water, is the mountain where God brings water from a rock 
to again save the people. That this is a holy spot, this mountain is a holy place. And yet they end up calling it testing and quarreling. How do we live in that space where our lives are challenging and we wonder where God is? I mean, because that's what's going on for the people here, right? That they've been encouraged on a path of freedom. But it doesn't look so free when everything is a struggle, when everything is a challenge and a difficulty, when everything is hard. What looks like freedom doesn't feel so free. How do you live in that space? I mean, it also makes us ask questions about water, right? What does it mean to thirst? When there are people who are thirsty, what are our obligations to them? And this is going to become a real challenge over the next 10 years and 20 years as water disappears as the planet heats. When people are thirsty, what are our obligations? How do we deal with that thirst? How do we share the water? And I wish I had an answer for you and I could say, boom, this is what's going to happen. But they're questions that we have to ask ourselves. And that our response to them should be guided by the faith that we've been given. How do we respond to people who are thirsty? We listen to the book of John. And what happens in the book of John with thirsty people? Jesus meets a woman at a well, and when Jesus encounters her, he talks about the living water, the water that she can receive that will bring her life. As the book continues and Jesus gets to his last discourses with the disciples, he again tells them that God is giving them the living water. So how do we use that sense that Jesus brings to us the living water, that Jesus will satisfy our thirst? Those are the questions our faith gives us. And this passage is good about that because it doesn't lend, end with a definitive proof, right? Moses brings the water streaming out of the rock. But it ends with the question, where is God for us? Why is God doing this in this spot? Where will God be in our challenges, in our troubles? 